So there's a game that came out recently, and I was going to start off with a joke about how you may not have heard about it before, but ironically enough, this game is actually so unpopular that there's a real statistically significant chance that you are clicking on my tiny little video here, and you might not have actually heard of Concord before. So yeah, Concord. In case you haven't actually seen this game yet, it's basically the most recent attempt in the hero shooter genre to dethrone games like Overwatch and the like. Big, objective-based 5v5 combat where you play as a variety of unique characters with special abilities and guns and yada yada yada. But if you have heard of this game before, then frankly, what's actually newsworthy isn't really any of the gameplay elements themselves. It's the fact that this game is bombing harder than I think any other AAA game has bombed in recent memory. The peak player count on launch, according to Steam's charts, was literally only 700 or so people, which puts it comfortably below the peak player count of such dumpster fires like that terrible, terrible Lord of the Rings Golem game that came out last year. Now, to be fair, and to give the game a little bit of credit, this does not include the PS5 numbers, which are undoubtedly higher, or at least add to the total. But it is definitely not a good sign that the game is doing this badly on PC. So, a question on everyone, or, well, I guess a question on some people's minds, is why is this game bombing so incredibly hard? I mean, it's a AAA hero shooter with upwards of eight years of development behind it, millions of dollars in funding, and it's been marketed at numerous major gaming events. This is a first-party Sony PlayStation game. So how do you mess up this hard such that nobody ends up caring about your game on release pretty much at all? Well, I think that there are a couple of reasons, but if you look up any of the discourse online, you will see countless people talking about how absolutely terrible and forgettable these character designs are. Now, this complaint is pretty widespread. I mean, it's basically the number one complaint you will see when you look up anything about the game. And I'm not saying that those people are wrong. In fact, I agree with them wholeheartedly. I think that these character designs look pretty awful and unappealing. But it's also a pretty vague criticism. Just saying that the characters look bad isn't really a particularly helpful critique. I mean, for one, why is the character design in particular ruining this game so hard? And is it really just a matter of taste? or is it something else? Well, with how nearly universal the negative reaction to this game has been, I think that it's far beyond a simple matter of taste. I think that this may be a case where people sort of have a gut feeling as to why they don't like something, but they might not be able to articulate a good specific explanation for why that is. Now, to be fair, I am by no means an artist. I can't draw the human figure to save my life, so I'm not about to try and break down the specific artistic choices and things like color theory to try and explain why these characters are ugly. But I think that the way that you design your game's characters actually can have a number of functional applications in game design as a whole. There is more to this kind of visual design than merely aesthetic appeal, although obviously that is still an important aspect of any game, if only for marketing reasons at the very least. Now, of course, the functional aspect of character design does matter to a varying degree depending on the kind of game that you're making. If you're making a turn-based RPG, for example, then the way you design your characters I think matters a lot less in a mechanical sense when compared to, say, a typical hero shooter like Overwatch. Essentially, it just becomes a matter of taste, like I mentioned earlier. But when you are talking about games like hero shooters, like Concord, your character design elements can become a much more important method of conveying information. Information. To show what I mean, in something like a turn-based RPG, like I said earlier, you can get away with things like having extensive tooltips and pop-ups that explain the exact abilities of any given character on screen. And since it's turn-based, the player has all of the time in the world that they want to read that information at their own pace. So the character's design doesn't really have to actually convey much information to the player. But in a more fast-paced action game, Game, character design becomes a lot more important. If I'm playing a game like Devil May Cry or Monster Hunter, I need to be able to tell exactly what each enemy is at a moment's notice because I simply do not have the time to be pulling up a journal every five minutes to see what the abilities of the enemies I'm fighting are. Even if I could pause the game to do that, I probably wouldn't want to as that would keep interrupting the flow of the fun I'm having. So, by ensuring that the characters in the game, in this case the enemies specifically, 
have unique and memorable designs, then that means I can go, oh, I know what you do as soon as I see them, and then employ the right strategy to take them out. So when it comes to this kind of functional character design, the two main points that we need to be on the lookout for are design elements that help convey what the character is capable of. So that would be things like a big character having a lot of health, or a character with less health ending up looking more scrawny looking. And then we also want to be on the lookout for design elements that are meant to help make a character more memorable, so that we can not only remember to associate those mechanical elements with that character, but also be able to pick them out in a crowd and be able to identify them at a glance. Then of course, like I said, there is also the aesthetic appeal and all the usual marketing reasons that you'd want to make a character look cool, but that is obviously much more subjective. Overall though, I think that this becomes even more important in a multiplayer context, and I think that a great example of good character design that we can take a look at to learn from is of course Team Fortress 2. TF2 is a class-based shooter with nine distinct types of characters that you can play, and since you are fighting other players, each character is inherently going to have as many unique abilities as every other character, so it's important that you can identify what those abilities are from a glance. So the design of the characters themselves has to do some heavy lifting. It's not just a matter of aesthetics anymore like it would be in an RPG. Like I said, each character needs to make sure that they convey both what their general role and combat abilities are, but also be memorable enough that you can identify them instantly. Take the Heavy for example. He's a big barrel chested man with massive arms and tiny legs. Even without knowing any of the weapons that he carries, it's immediately obvious that you are looking at a big frontline tank here. This guy clearly has a lot of health and isn't particularly concerned about his mobility, and he probably packs a punch on the offense side too. Then you have a character like the Scout, who is the complete opposite. He's a lot scrawnier and his legs are a lot more proportional. He also has his socks riding up towards his knees with his pants tucked into them, which helps emphasize his legs even more. So again, even without knowing anything about the game or what weapons he uses, I think anyone can instantly identify this character as a low health, speedy, run and gun style of character. And all of TF2's characters are nearly perfect in this regard. If you look at someone like the Engineer or the Pyro or the Medic, I probably don't even have to break down their designs at all, because what they do feels immediately obvious to pretty much anyone that looks at them. And on top of that, they each have memorable aspects of their character that makes them stand out from each of the other characters. The engineer is wearing a hard hat and goggles with big overalls. The medic is wearing a huge white coat, which makes him stand out from the rest of his team with their more red and blue focused designs. The pyro is covered in a fireproof suit and has a gas mask on. These design elements don't just help you identify what kinds of abilities that these characters have, but they also stand out as unique, memorable identifiers so you don't forget which character is which and can identify them at a glance for split second decision making. So with these ideas fresh in our minds, I think it's about time we took another look at Concord. Concord has 16 characters to choose from, so let's just grab a few of them at random and see what we get. Take this person for example, their name is apparently Raka, and what can you tell me about their character just by looking at them? Go ahead, pause the video and post in the comments below if you think you know what they can do in the game. Right off the bat, they have an incredibly boring tan and beige color palette with only a splash of red in the visor of the helmet, so just in terms of color choices, I'm already losing interest in this character. Plus, the skin-tight suit that they're wearing is really giving me nothing to really work with here. So in terms of trying to ascertain their mechanics, I mean, I guess maybe the muted color palette and the fact that they're covered from head to toe in a thin suit could make them a stealth character? But obviously that's clearly wrong because she's holding a giant rocket launcher. So what kind of stealth character does that? And that's the thing. I have to kind of fall back onto looking at the weapon to better identify this character. Because without the rocket launcher, I have almost nothing to go off of here. If you gave her a pistol, she would look like a more generic running gun type character. If you gave her a shotgun, I would have no choice but to assume that she must be some kind of close range damage dealer. The fact that her weapon is the only identifiable feature of her character shows just how poor her design is. And even then, her weapon doesn't really tell me anything about her actual abilities and playstyle. Is she some kind of run and gun glass cannon that can deal big damage up close but can't take a hit? Is she some kind of long range AoE character? Well, if you want to actually know the answer, just looking up some gameplay of her, she basically has the same abilities as Pharah from Overwatch. She can fly into the air and use her, her rocket launcher to rain down justice from above. And now, let's just put these two characters side by side for a minute. Do you see any slight differences in how these characters are made? 
Farah, right off the bat, has a way more interesting and memorable color palette than this person does, with bold, striking blues and golds. She's clearly very well armored to reflect the fact that she uses explosives, but she still has a slim physique to represent that she's highly mobile. Oh, and there's the very slight detail, maybe you haven't picked up on it yet, but in case you haven't noticed, she, uh, she looks like a goddamn bird, you know, to represent the fact that she can fly as the main centerpiece of her kit. The helmet she wears is very purposefully using gold as the color of her prominent pointed visor to make it look like a bird beak, and she has very prominent, gigantic jetpack wings that jut out to her sides, which immediately tells anyone that looks at her that her main gimmick is that she can fly, which is a huge core element of this character that is missing from the visual design of the Concord iteration. I'm not saying you have to be clever here. The character can fly, so they evoke bird imagery to get that idea across. It's very simple, but it works very well, especially when compared to this other character who is just wearing some kind of generic skin-type bodysuit and a fairly boring-looking helmet. But okay, maybe that's just one bad apple. Let's look at a few others. Take this character, uh, Hamar is their name apparently. What do you get from their design? Again, feel free to take a guess down below if you want to play along at home. And this time, the weapon is invisible in their hero card, so we can't cheat by looking at that for a hint. So. They're wearing some boring gray robes with some gold beads around their belt, so in terms of color palette, I feel like we're off to a pretty bad start once again. Though they have some red magenta trim, I guess, and I guess they have some leather sleeves too. I mean, I'm really at a loss for what character traits I'm supposed to be going off of here. And like I said, I can't even look at the weapon for a hint, not that I think that it would even help in this instance. Well, do you know what they do? They're a straight-up fire wizard. <laughs> That's right, they could shoot explosives, summon walls of flame, flashbang people. None of these abilities are coming off through the character design whatsoever. The closest they come to an identifiable trait is having the red trim along her robes, but that's such a subtle detail that it really does not come off like an important character trait, especially when compared to the fact that her whole gimmick is that she can shoot fire. Let's compare this to a game that hasn't actually come out yet with Deadlock's Infernus. Now, as you can probably guess by that name, this guy is very very fire oriented as well. But I probably didn't need to tell you that on the account of the fact that this guy is wearing a red shirt, a red hat, has orange sunglasses, and has bright glowing orange tattoos on his arms. Even if he wasn't literally on fire in every artwork that he's in, he conveys the idea of being a suave, cool, fire based character about a million times more clearly than Haymar does. Hell, the fact that he's using finger guns instead of carrying any obvious weapons helps reinforce that he's clearly got some kind of innate ability that he's using. Whereas if we actually saw Haymar's weapon, which is a hand crossbow by the way, that really doesn't help me at all figure out that she's actually a fire wizard, and it's so small that it's not really something I can identify at a glance anyways. And I mean, we can just keep playing this game over and over again, and we will keep running into the same problems. Baz here is allegedly a melee specialist, despite having no real visible armor or other identifiers that would make them look like a melee character, though I guess their design is at least unique. Daw is apparently a support medic that deploys drones, and they have nothing in their design that makes them look like any kind of doctor or engineer beyond maybe the gloves they have on, which is again, way too subtle of a detail to really be identifiable at a glance. Jabali here gives me some sniper vibes with that wide-brimmed hat and the goggles, and he's got some kind of long-barreled gun, so maybe things are starting to come together a bit here, except for the fact that he's actually just another mid-ranged healer character. Teo is the first one that I saw that unironically actually looks like the role he plays in game, with him just looking like a generic shooterman, and his abilities being that he's a generic shooterman. But again, he's still lacking any kind of memorable traits that I can attach to. Compare him to Soldier 76 from Overwatch, who at least has that cool jacket and a visor that makes him stand out a little bit, despite also being a generic shooterman. But yeah, even when a character in this game does at least a decent job at conveying what role they play, like how Amari here is clearly some kind of frontline tank, and Vale is clearly some kind of sniper, they still often lack any kind of memorable traits to make them stick in my mind. My eyes just roll off of Amari's smooth, boring armor, and Vale, I mean honestly, I think Vale is my favorite character in the roster aesthetically, but even then she still has an incredibly boring, muted color scheme that just makes her feel forgettable to look at. 
So yeah, I think you get the idea by now. Character design is an important part of these kinds of fast-paced action games, and I think that this game utterly fails at the important mechanical aspects of that character design. At best, these characters might manage to have some memorable or unique aspect of their design without really conveying what they do, or they might convey a general idea of what they do, but without really having any interesting memorable qualities. And at the end of the day, based on the universal reaction to this game's trailers, I think it's pretty clear that they also fail to just make characters that are aesthetically appealing at all, which is a pretty important part of a hero shooter as well. If I'm watching gameplay and none of the characters look interesting enough for me to want to play as them, then that's going to directly harm sales. Plus, the vaguely sci-fi shooter aesthetic is, I think, wearing a bit thin by now with how many sci-fi shooters there are on the market these days between games like Overwatch, numerous Call of Duty spin-offs, Titanfall, and so many others. I mean, hell, one of the things I love about Deadlock by comparison is that it's going for a more mystical style compared with the classic 1920s gangster aesthetic, which I think helps make the game really stand out in the crowd and give it a much more cohesive art style that all of its characters are built around. Not to mention that I think that Concord also falls into one of the more general artistic traps of wanting to strive for too much realism. To me, Overwatch, TF2s, and Deadlock's more cartoony art styles helps make their characters more charming. We don't need to see every pore in their skin to become attached to them. Meanwhile, characters in Concord look like random people off the street who just took a couple of random items from a sci-fi thrift shop. And like, take this lizard guy for example. He looks less like a lizard man and more like a human in lizard makeup, like he's from Star Trek or something. I personally think that he would look far more interesting and appealing if he was a lot more lizard-like and a lot less detailed, which would also make him stand out a lot more from this very otherwise humanoid looking cast. But instead, they very clearly cared about trying to make this game as graphically intense as possible, and as a result, they just made him look like whatever mocap after they got on set and glued some lizard spikes onto him. And this is just my opinion, but I've always felt like going for a more distinct art style is always going to be more universally appealing than trying to strive for realism. I mean, after all, what is considered realistic today will always look outdated in like five years or so, so it's always just a losing battle. Meanwhile, games that focus on unique art styles tend to be a lot more timeless. I mean, TF2 still looks good to this day, despite coming out in 2007. But yeah, to get back on track with character design, the next question is, what could Concord have done to improve their characters? Well, I'm not trying to say that you have to rely on the exact same tropes that games like Overwatch or Deadlock do to design their characters, because while well, yes, I do think that a character like Farah is objectively better designed than Concord's equivalent, that doesn't mean that they necessarily had to design her to look like Farah to make her work. Giving her prominent wings on her jetpack could be one way of helping convey her flying abilities, but you could also go in a number of different directions and give her things like a pair of helicopter propellers that jut out from her back to get the same idea across, or any number of other flying devices. And maybe instead of this generic space helmet, you could give her something that looks a more akin to like what a fighter pilot would wear, to again help reinforce that flight aspect. And additionally, one of her other abilities is that she can rocket down to slam on the ground to deal damage after flying, so maybe she should be wearing some kind of giant boots to help convey that idea, as well as to help justify how she's even able to do that without breaking her legs every time. Plus, you could probably put some rockets on those boots to tie it back into the flight thing even more. And as for colors, I think they chose blue for Farah because it's like the sky and possibly went with blue and gold to be like the blue angel. So like, there's not a terrible choice there, but you could maybe use things like white to represent clouds or maybe even make her suit black with white stars on it to make her look like the night sky since we're in space after all. There's, there's different ways that they could have gone with it that would still make sense and reinforce her character's abilities. Again, I'm obviously not an artist. I'm not saying I can draw a character better than the artist who drew this character can. And honestly, I don't think that the problems here are the fault of those artists, because this kind of character design is a collaborative process between the game designers, the directors, and the artists. The artists need to be given clear direction to emphasize these kinds of character traits to make sure that they in turn work for conveying the gameplay information that they need to convey. So I think that the problem here, as is the problem that ruins so many other games, is that this game clearly just had 
terrible management and direction. Whoever was managing this project clearly didn't think that it was important for the character artists to collaborate with the people designing each character's abilities. And as a result, it feels like each character was designed with the most bare bones information and then were barely iterated upon beyond that. They clearly needed to be more back and forth and iteration between the artists and the gameplay designers working together on each character to try and make sure that the important character traits that represent their gameplay were emphasized. And then you can get the writers on board as well to help emphasize things like stuff from their backstories to help make the characters feel more unique and memorable. The fact that these character designs are so divorced from their gameplay just makes the game feel like each element was designed in a vacuum and then stitched together at the last minute, despite how much time and money went into it. And I just feel like that's a real shame. But yeah, here at the end, while we're winding down, I just want to touch on a couple of other elements that I think did or didn't contribute to this game's ultimate failure that are also floating around in the discourse. For one, there are obviously a number of people that are trying to use this game's failure to push an agenda. So no, I do not think that this game failed because its characters are too diverse or anything stupid like that. Needless to say, there are countless examples of games with a diverse range of representation in ethnicities and body types and whatnot and so forth that have made millions and have shown that you can make cool and appealing characters with a wide range of body types before. I mean, hell, I feel like Overwatch alone should probably be enough of an example to disprove this point, and the brand new Deadlock also has a pretty diverse range of characters as well, and that game is crushing Concord despite being invite only. And another much sillier point that I've seen over the console war space is people trying to argue that Concord could have done a lot better if only it came out on Xbox too. And I'm just like, it already released on PS5 and PC, which is a huge majority of the possible gaming market share, whereas Xbox consoles are doing really badly right now. Would it really sell more copies that way? Like, like would it sell an additional couple of copies? Sure, probably. But like I just said, the PC already has a much larger install base, and it's doing terribly there. So I don't see how selling maybe an extra 300 copies on Xbox is supposed to turn things around. And for that matter, I don't think that it's just a matter of being tired of the hero shooter genre. I mean, despite all of the strife that has happened with Overwatch, it's still pulling pretty massive numbers by comparison. And again, Deadlock, while technically not a hero shooter, is still doing really, really well despite being in a closed alpha. Though, that does bring up another point which I think is valid, which is the price tag. This is arguably the other biggest factor with this game that is causing it problems, and that is the fact that it costs $40 to play. Now sure, back when it first came out, Overwatch also cost $40, but there were a lot fewer hero shooters back then, and nowadays that game is free to play. Similarly, Deadlock is also lacking any kind of monetization currently, and I don't know what, it'll, what its final product will be like, but I imagine that game will also probably be free to play, as is Team Fortress 2. So, launching at a $40 price tag up front is definitely not doing this game any favors when its direct competition is free. It's basically the same problem that Valve's card game Artifact had when the most when most other popular digital card games went with a free-to-play model. It can be argued whether the price tag or the bad character designs have done more harm to this game, but the reason why I would argue that the character designs are the biggest factor is because we already have an example of a, the game being in a more accessible state. Before launch, there was a pre-order beta, so anyone who pre-ordered the game could play in the beta, and that didn't do so hot, but then they opened up the beta to just anyone, so that anybody could try the game out without any mod monetary incentive. And even then, on Steam, they only peaked at around 2,300 players. So I feel like even if the game launched with a price tag of zero dollars and did twice as good as it did in the beta, it would still be an unmitigated failure compared to how much money went into it. And like, looking at various reviews, the gameplay is at least serviceable. Hell, some people actually liked the writing and things like that, so there's a number of other aspects of the game that are at least nowhere near as universally hated as the character designs. So I think that we have nothing left to really blame but the art direction for this game's failure. And I think that that makes sense because, like I said earlier, if a game just doesn't look appealing, then they're not going to give it the time of day, regardless of how good your gameplay or story or whatever else might be. And I mean, I'm normally a gameplay-first kind of guy. I will play a game if I enjoy the gameplay a lot more than like the story or the art direction or things like that. But 
you need me to actually play the game first. And if the game is ugly, then that's just not going to happen. But, as always, I'm happy to continue the conversation in the comments down below. What do you think about Concord and its art direction? Did you even hear about the game before watching this video? And either way, do you think that the game was really killed by its poor character design? Sure, it was probably never going to be the next Overwatch, even in the best of timelines, but clearly something must be going terribly wrong for something to sell this poorly, despite how much money went into it. And if you liked what you saw, remember to leave me a like if you want to see me make more videos like this, then make sure to subscribe and ring the bell so that you can get notified of when I make more videos in the future. If you want to really help the channel out, then you can become a member on YouTube or donate to my Ko-Fi to help me keep doing what I'm doing. But for now, thank you all for watching, and I hope to see you all in the next one.